Good afternoon. It's my privilege to introduce uh, Professor Anup Malani from the law school who is going to be talking for us uh, today. And let me just give you a little bit of background for those of you who do not know Anup. He is the Aaron Director Research Scholar at the University of Chicago Law School. He's also a professor of medicine at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. He teaches health law, food and drug law, insurance law, bankruptcy contracts and corporations. His research interests include law and economics, the welfare evaluation of legal rules and the economics of product liability, health economics and policy, including control of infectious disease, the conduct of clinical trials, medical malpractice and drug products liability, as well as conflicts of interest in medical research and the placebo effect. Uh, Professor Milani graduated from the University of Chicago Law School and the University of Chicago with a PhD in economics under Gary Becker. He clerked for the Honorable Stephen Williams at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and the U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. He has held faculty positions here at the University and the Health Evaluation Science Department at the University of Virginia Medical School. He was a visiting professor at Harvard Law and the interim director of the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. Currently, he's on the Committee on Clinical and Translational Sciences here in the BSD and editor of the Journal of Law and Economics. Today, his talk will be entitled <laughs> Addressing Racial Disparities in Hospital. Actually, a new title, Civil Rights Litigation and Racial Disparities in Healthcare. That's why I didn't have it on my sheet. Uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Milani. And, be and before he starts, just a reminder, this is not a uh, microphone that projects, but it's important for the taping, so when you want to ask questions, you've got to grab the mic. Okay, I guess the first thing I've got to write down is a notice to, to get you a shorter bio. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was a or mouthful. Your mother. Yeah. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to talk about a topic that, you know, uh, that I'm not an expert in, uh, as it turns out, it's, but it's an area that I'm trying to... Uh, start doing a little bit of research in. And in part, it's because uh, uh, of an introduction to the field from a very good friend of mine, Amitabh Chandra, who's a professor at the Kennedy School. Uh, and he's been working on disparities for a decade now. And uh, one of the nice things when you're new to a field is you look at it from a different perspective uh, than somebody that's been in it for a while. And so we're finding that there are a lot of synergies between you know, his extensive experience and me asking kind of silly, simple questions about, well, why, why could this be the cause? Why isn't that a solution? Uh, and so we're finding this to be a, a lot of fun to work on together. Uh, and our third, uh, the third author here is Michael Frakus, who's a, a PhD uh, student uh, out of MIT and also has a JD. He's currently, he's actually a student of mine at the Petrie Flom Center, and that's how I met him. Uh, he's a very talented person um, and, again, also has a, a budding interest in civil rights. So, so this is a fun topic to work in. But I do want to clarify, I am neither a civil rights law expert. It's not a class that I teach. I don't teach equal protection or constitutional law. Uh, I do teach health policy, and I think that racial disparities in health care uh, and in health policy are, are very important. So it's, very, it's a big omission uh, on my part not to have studied this topic a little bit earlier and hoping to, with this uh, short paper, uh, to, to kind of remedy that, that, that failing. OK. So I'm going to try in this talk to cover three topics. Uh, the first is I'm going to try to kind of give you a, uh, a glimpse of how I look at the question, what are the source of, of racial disparities in healthcare treatment and outcomes? Then I'm going to ask a question that uh, is more appropriate for a lawyer. And so I think that I, I might be able to shed some light on is, and that is, uh, can we reduce the degree of racial disparity in healthcare? Uh, and health outcomes by either improving enforcement of Title VI or by expanding the scope of, of Title VI. Um, and when I went into this, I, you know, I was kind of optimistic. Uh, you know, I've, everybody is uh, educated with, with uh, uh, or educated in the, the great success stories uh, of the Civil Rights Act of 64. And so I thought, you know, wh why should healthcare be different? But the more I looked at it, the more I uh, became pessimistic that, that that's really the tool that we need now to address the, the, the disparities that persist. And so I'm going to propose some alternative remedies that I hope, uh, or I think at least at this point, are going to be more effective at reducing those disparities. So it's a little bit awkward for me as a lawyer to say, I'm not the solution. Uh, I like to tell people I'm the solution and have them pay me. Uh, so this is a little bit awkward. But that, that, be that as it may. So let me start out with uh, the Institute of Medicine's report on racial disparities. Uh, this is from 2003. 
And they did an extensive analysis of the literature on racial disparities. Uh, and they acknowledged that the disparities uh, have uh, a lot of sources. They're historical sources, they're institutional sources, and things like that. But after reviewing the literature, they said that they would focus on what they think the key element is, and that is summarized here. The study committee focused on the clinical encounter and found that there was evidence of stereotyping biases and uncertainty on the part of healthcare providers, and they can all contribute to unequal treatment. Um, the conditions in which many clinical encounters take place, high time pressure, cognitive complexity, and pressures for, uh, for cost containment, there shouldn't be an S there, may enhance the likelihood of care poorly matched to minority patients' needs. And while they did acknowledge a lot of other causes, the focus was on issues when a doctor sees a patient, so on the provider, individual provider-patient relationship. But when I think about the source of disparity, I want to actually say wh while it may be true that there are disparities uh, between the doctor, uh, disparities caused by, by problems in the relationship between, and that's, that's a euphemism, problems in the relationship between uh, a doctor and a patient, when you think globally, you want to kind of divide up the disparities into three bins. Kind of just thinking as an empiricist rather than uh, uh, anything else, uh, a historian or a, or, or a lawyer. I like to think of the world as having within disparity, not as having, but I, I like to think that I can break down the world into within disparities, between disparities, and issues of access. And when I say within disparities, that means that if, if a, 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 a black individual and a white individual goes to a given provider, is there a difference in the treatment that the black individual get, will get relative to the white individual, um, or the difference in outcomes between these two people holding the provider constant? So it's within provider disparity between blacks and whites. And just to be simple, I'm going to use the term black and white, but, but it, you know, broadly speaking, it's minority, non-minority. But th those are a little bit uh, longer words, so I'm going to use black, white, uh, knowing that, that that's somewhat inaccurate. Then there's between disparities, and that is, I'm going to see if there's a, I I'd like to see if, if, if the part of the problem is that uh, blacks go to a set of providers, whites go to a different set of providers, and the problem is that the providers are different. Okay, so it's between provider uh, uh, disparities. So this is within provider disparities, between provider disparities. Perhaps blacks are going to worse providers uh, or are treated by worse providers. I don't want to uh, assert that the active voice or passive voice there. And the last thing is an issue of access. So maybe uh, blacks and whites have different rates of getting access to providers to begin with. So uh, it's that, that blacks are less likely to go to a provider or be given access to a provider, whereas whites are more likely to do so. So we want to look at that margin too. Okay, so they think of this as the extensive margin, and these are two dimensions of what, what an economist might call the intensive margin. And what we'd like to do is an empirical study, a large-scale empirical study, some of this has, start, has begun, trying to take all the disparities uh, and, and break it apart into these, 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 uh, these, these bins. Okay? Um, and then once you do break it apart into the bin, you want to figure out why it is that there is, for example, a within disparity, or why there is a between disparity, or why there is an access disparity. And without knowing the data, we can kind of come up with some theories for why you have within disparities. Now, I'm trained as an economist, so I, I tend to put things into an economic framework. And for me, an economic framework is uh, something like the following. I want to know within, so holding a provider constant, why is that provider treating, and by the way, the provider could be a doctor or it could be a, a, a hospital. It could be a full institution. Why is it treating a black different than a white? Or why is the black getting a, a different outcome than the white? One reason is there could be lower financial or medical returns. So lower financial returns, perhaps the black individual has different rates of insurance or, 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 uh, or uh, uh, coverage uh, by insurance. Alternatively, there could be different rates of medical return to particular treatment. That may explain the difference. For example, uh, when I say biology, I mean maybe a treatment is less appropriate for one racial group than another racial group, or an, uh, an individual of an individual of a racial group or not. Right? It doesn't have to be based on race. It could be something like, uh, it, it's, it, you know, this, you know, angioplasty is inappropriate this, for this person, and this person happens to be a member of a minority community. It could be there's differential rates of compliance, okay? And again, uh, it could be that those are correlated with race, but it's the compliance that, that could be the issue. Alternatively, there could be higher cost of treatment. For example, there might be language barriers, and the IOM <coughs> focuses a little bit on this, and a little bit on cultural barriers. And then finally, there's also just the direct bias. You cannot, if you ran a regression on what is the difference between a, how a black is treated and a white is treated for a given provider, you put in all the variables you want to, insurance, biology, compliance, language, cultural barriers, et cetera, 
there's still a residual left that's identified by just being black. That is what you might call racial bias. Now, I want to be a little, before I answer that, I want to be careful about something. Even if I call only the thing that's captured by, a, you know, say, the, the, the variable black in a regression as direct bias, I want to be very clear. That doesn't mean that there isn't black-white disparity through all the other mechanisms. So for example, if you've got differential rates of compliance, perhaps because African Americans don't trust providers as much as, as white patients do, then you're going to see a loading on compliance. You're going to find that compliance may explain stuff, but you're not really getting at the root cause, which may be that there are differential, there, there's a reason why African Americans are uh, less trustful of doctors than non-African Americans, right? Or, or minorities uh, less trustful than non-minorities. Also, to some extent, there could be language barriers or cultural barriers that are also that also overlap with black-white. So you want to be careful not to say, hey, if I run a regression, I only find a waiting on, you know, X amount of waiting on black after I control for other thing. That, that other stuff means that that's not bias or that's not disparate treatment. It could be. It's just that, that there's overlap here be, uh, between uh, being black and having some of these other features. So now we can ask the same sort, do the same sort of analysis with between disparities and say, okay, why are there between disparities? Why do some providers provide higher quality care and other providers provide lower quality care and some are more likely to be treating uh, blacks and some are more likely to be treating whites, okay? And so you might say, oh, quality has costs and higher quality facilities located in an area with higher profit. That's the general economic framework. The quality uh, tends towards profit because it it's costly. And so you want to say, why is it that uh, communities with higher concentration of African Americans are not getting the quality facilities, quality doctors, quality hospitals, quality nursing homes, you name it. And one possibility is that those communities are poor or have less insurance. And so they're not, they're not able to offer the sorts of profits that are required to attract quality providers. Alternatively, there could be higher costs. But here you want to be a little bit careful because it's not obvious that African American communities are, have higher cost. On the one hand, if it's true that there's more poverty, then in fact you're going to get lower rents there. And so land's going to be less expensive. But the flip side is that you might be harder to get providers, for example, if there's bias or something like that, uh, or, or so, some other issue, harder to get providers to come and work at a hospital in a minority community. And so you have to pay higher wages, or you have to deal with lower quality providers. And then the last thing is you might actually have institutional bias, right? And you don't have to go back to 1964 and segregation to get, implicit, uh, to get direct bias. You could find other reasons for it as well. But again, the important thing to remember is just because you find us today, you find even if you found a small coefficient on this, that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of black-white gap. It could be seeping in through the fact that the reason you have to pay higher wages is because providers don't want to work in minority communities. Correctly or incorrectly, they have bad impressions. It could be that there are gaps in insurance and poverty that are actually themselves driven by black-white gaps, right? There could be uh, problems that lead to lower human capital investment for African Americans that leads to poverty, uh, or it could be that blacks are systematically denied access to insurance. You're seeing that in an insurance variable, but you don't explain why it is that, that African Americans have lower insurance or why they might have higher poverty. And those are, again, just hard to get at sources of the gap. So this gives you, and by the way, this is the same sort of analysis you deal with to address issues of not just why is a high quality provider versus a low quality provider locating in a minority community, but why is there sometimes no provider locating in the, in the uh, minority community, okay? <coughs> what we want to do with this is not just figure out the causes. I said we want to figure out the source of disparity. And I will admit that it's extremely hard to disentangle this. This is a lifetime project. And as a, as a, as a novice in the area, this area, I, I can't just come in and criticize. I should be doing something positive, but I do want to point out and acknowledge that it's a difficult problem. What I'm going to do is try to show you some evidence on how much of the disparity is within or between. And I think that's going to be important for policy. That is to say, is it that a given provider treats blacks and whites differently, or is it on average uh, a situation where blacks and whites go to different providers, the black, going to, uh, black individual going to a worse provider on, in terms of quality? Now, let's start with some really obvious things. First. My microphone came off. That's the first obvious thing. The second obvious thing is that blacks go to different hospitals than whites do. And the way that we indicate this is that we rank hospitals. Uh, so this is, this is primarily relying on work done by Amitabh Chandra um, and, and various co-authors. We rank hospital by the, by the number of black discharges. So if you've got 
um, uh, a lot of whites, and if you've got, sorry, if you've got a lot of blacks and if you've got a lot of whites. And then I'm going to give you the CDF for how many, what practice, uh, percentage of discharges are available in those hospitals. And what you find is, as you go across these hospitals, you're slowly accounting for all the white uh, discharges gradually. But you'll see that these set of hospitals are quite, a, 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 the initial set of hospitals are, are uh, accounting for a, a very high fraction of the black discharges right away. So these guys are doing a lot of the work when it terms to accounting for the, the, the black discharges. Um, and these ones are doing very little. In fact, at the end, there's going to be a lot of um, providers that are providing very little, lots of cares to white individuals, but very little in, in terms of changing the percentage uh, that are black. Okay. So the, in, in short, blacks are going to a different set of hospitals than whites are. And partly that's because of where they live. So this is a map that has the ratio of black population uh, to the average percentage of the population that's black. So if you have a place that has twice as many blacks as the average community, the, you will have a, a ratio of two, and you'll have a darker color than if you have less. What you see is African Americans are still relative to the national average, still located largely uh, in the southern Atlantic states. So when we think about, when we put these two last, fi last two figures together, what we're getting is blacks and whites are going to different hospitals. Okay? Hospitals are, are organized by communities. And so what we're basically saying is blacks are going to hospitals here, and whites are going to hospitals here, roughly speaking. It's a popular geographic distribution problem. And the hospitals that blacks go to are lower, qu lower quality. So this table is giving you 90-day mortality after a heart attack by decile of heart attack patients uh, who are African-American admitting hospital. So we're, we're turning things around, and we're saying these are the hospitals that are mostly black, that are, ha have a high rate of black discharges, and these are hospitals that have low rate of discharges. A higher number is a higher mortality rate, so a higher number is bad. And the blue versus purple bars have different levels of controls for uh, covariates such as age, race, sex, uh, uh, sometimes other hospital ownership and treatment characteristics. So in some sense, the, uh, the purple bar, this, this comes across as blue and purple to me, I guess, or, or purple and red. But these right, right bars are ones that have more controls in there. But no matter what you do, you see that basically hospitals tar, uh, you know, that deal with largely with blacks have much higher mortality post-heart attack than ones that do with whites. Okay? Now you might say, okay, well, that may be true, but what's the black-white gap within the hospital? So are the bad hospitals treating blacks and whites differently? Are the good hospitals treating blacks and whites differently? Let's answer that question. As it turns out, black hospitals are worse for all races who, that go there. So, if you're in a, so now we've changed things around, and we're going to have the light bar be non-blacks and the dark bar be blacks. And the difference between them says for a hospital in the second decile, that is to say generally treating um, more whites than blacks, very few blacks. The difference between the bars is the difference is that within disparity. And as you go across, you're getting the between disparity. Okay? So I want to know if the problem is blacks are going to worse hospitals or whether it's a, any given hospital is treating a black person worse. And what you find is you find sizable differences as you go from predominantly white hospitals to predominantly black hospitals. Again, the outcome is 90 day mortality after AMI. Right? So for example, here you're looking at both groups have about a 21% mortality. You go over here, you're getting around a 24% mortality. That's a meaningful difference. Okay? And you get a similar story for ambulatory care. Right? This is not just inpatient. So here what we did is, is uh, and again, I want to credit Amitabh for, for doing the brunt of the work here. Um, you take the percentage, uh, so, so here we're, uh, you take Medicare data. You uh, are looking at outpatient uh, diabetes care, ambulatory uh, diabetes care. You group uh, ambulatory facilities into three tiers of quality, the lowest tier, the middle tier, and the highest tier of quality. And by quality, I mean the uh, percentage of recommended diabetes care that that's actually received. Okay? So in the highest tier, you're in the high 70s, low 80s. In the lowest tier, you're in the high 60s, low 70s in terms of the percentage of recommended care the patients actually receive. And then you can say, okay, 
within each of these quality tiers, by the way, it's harder to do geographic matching for ambulatory care. It's easier to do for hospitals. And um, that's why I'm not doing it just uh, uh, on that basis. I'm doing it on quality. I'm saying in a low quality hospital, what is the difference between how uh, uh, a black is treated in terms of percentage of care they get, percentage of recommended care they get versus a, a black? Whites are getting, or non-blacks are getting 71, at the lowest quality, uh, lowest quality facilities, they're getting 71% of the recommended care. Non-whites are, non-blacks are. Blacks are only getting 65%. And there's a gap also here, even at the highest one, where the uh, non-blacks are getting 82% and, and blacks are getting 77%. So there is a within disparity, but there's also a sizable disparity across the different tiers. And the important thing to remember is 50% of the blacks are in this tier, but only a third or less, actually, of whites or non-blacks are in this tier. So the real problem is you're sampling the worst hospitals the most, and that's explaining a large portion of the disparity. I, sh I misspoke, not hospitals. Ambulatory care facilities for diabetes. Okay, Again, a similar story for hospitals and for outpatient facilities. So, so far, what, what's the punchline? So far, between uh, differences are a large source of the disparity. Okay, and in fact, if we wanted me to put a number on it, I can do that for hospitals. For hospitals, if you take the black-white gap in health outcomes on a, in various different measures, say 90-day mortality after AMI, about 60% of the gap can be explained as a between gap. That is to say, if we eliminated the difference between the hospitals that blacks and whites went to, the gap would fall by 60%. Okay, the rest is within. Again, I'm not telling you why there's a between and why there's a win-in, just the allocation between the two. That's what we have decent data for right now. Okay, so now the question is, turn the page, do I think that civil rights laws can help? Well, to, to address this question, let's turn to Title VI. We're going to look at Section 601, the main part. And it says, in no uncertain terms, no person in the United States shall, on the grounds of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation in, denied the benefits of, or be subject to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Okay, this doesn't just apply to a small group of facilities. This applies to a lot of facilities. Anybody receiving Medicaid or Medicare money is subject to Title VI. So you would think that this is a huge stick, right? And the larger the Medicare or Medicaid budget grows, the bigger the stick, right? The more facilities they get it, that's bigger. And it was a huge, huge success, right? So the, six, the, the civil rights laws passed in 64. In 65, you get Medicare. And the first thing that happens is uh, the government agency, uh, it's no longer, it wasn't HHS back then, responsible for uh, administering Medicare said that you only get Medicare certification if you have integrated hospital facilities. And this was about as big, I mean, we spend all our time in law school thinking about the great civil rights successes in education. We're studying the wrong things, folks. This was a huge success. In four months, you got 1,000 hospitals to integrate. Unbelievable. And the success in terms of improving health outcomes, just, you know, it, it's amazing. Right? It's just shocking that it wasn't done earlier. 6,000 blacks were saved between 65 and 75. But if you want to get a sense of it, it's very hard to get a sense of it. Uh, through numbers, I like to look at, at figures. Here's some figures. This is trend, and by the way, Medicare's targeted old people. I'm going to show you infant mortality results associated with, with integration. So this is trends in infant mortality by race between 1950 and 1990. This line is the one for blacks. The middle line is the one for whites. And this line is the gap between them. So this is kind of like the treatment effect. Look at the huge, so you've got pretty stable gaps up until 65, and then after 65, huge drop off. I mean, this is unbelievable. Right? We can only dream about these sorts of things. I mean, it's, the sad thing is that we needed this. Right? One would like to achieve that sort of result again. OK. So do I know that certification is responsible? This is a great study by uh, Doug Allman, Ken Che, uh, and Mike Greenstone um, back in 2007. When I saw this, my eyes just popped. So what they wanted to figure out was, 
you know, what, what was going on? Did, after 65, was it something else or was it something specific about Medicare and certification and thereby specific to the civil rights laws? And so they said, let's just figure out if um, certification was the key thing. So they said, let's look at the number of, I think they're looking at uh, time relative to, to uh, Medicare certification of a hospital in a county. These are years and these are years before and after. And what you find is before you're certified, remember in order to certify you've got to integrate. So this is really just a proxy for the date that you integrate. You look at all cause, this is, by the way, these are black white differences so it's like the treatment effect from the last graph. And you're looking at all cause uh, post neonatal mortality and preventable cause uh, post neonatal mortality. Stable gaps up until you get certified, i.e. until you integrate and then you integrate and bam. Right, amazing reductions. This is, this is why the civil rights laws inspire hope, okay? Now, they, that was a great accomplishment. So then they went on to other, now, by the way, gaps didn't die out. There's still gaps. I know this is just infant mortality, but so you want to start addressing this. So you want to look at other sources of disparity. And so we turned, we said, okay, not by litigation, by the way, just by a regulatory action, we had a huge reduction in, in racial disparities. Now let's look at what's remaining. Let's start using the litigation tool, and we're going to go after hospitals that are denying admitting privileges to black doctors. We're going to want uh, hospitals that have uh, prepayment requirements for blacks. So you know, a white person comes in, doesn't have to prepay, but a black person comes in, has to prepay. And, and maybe we'll also talk about hospitals. So this happened with schools where people took their kids out of schools and sent them off to suburbs where there happens with hospitals as well. Hospitals may be leaving inner cities where there's a high density of minorities and going to suburbs where there's a relatively low density of minorities to white suburbs. So uh, basically the hospital version of white flight. And we started challenging all these. And we were extremely successful here, but we failed to stop the relocation using Title VI. And the question is why? And by the way, I'm just giving you history right now. So in order to answer this, I think you have to think about how Title VI cases are prosecuted. Title VI cases have three stages. Okay, have three stages. In, and here P is plaintiff and D is defendant. Uh, I, I, can't, I lapse into these abbreviations because I'm a lawyer. <laughs> uh, so, so plaintiff, the first thing that happens, plaintiff goes to court, presents prima facie evidence of discrimination, you discriminate against me, or I say, you've done some activity, and I've noticed that blacks are doing worse than whites are at your facility. So I don't have to show that you discriminated. I could show either that you discriminated or there's just disparate impact. And so this allows in disparate impact or disparate treatment into court. Okay? It's supposed to make it easier, lower the hurdle. But that, once you provide disparate evidence of disparate impact, then you go to the second stage. In the second stage, the defendant gets to come up and say, Actually, there is a legitimate reason for my activity. Okay? Now, if they can't come up with a legitimate reason, then you're done. But if they can come up with a legitimate reason, then you go to stage three. The burden shifts back to the plaintiff. The plaintiff has to show that the reason, one of two things, the reason that the, that the defendant offered is pretext for discrimination. Okay? It's baloney. Or they have to say, you know, you could have achieved the exact same goal without having a disparate impact on minorities. Okay? So, uh, let me give you, see how this would play out in, in these two cases. So in privilege and prepayment cases, the defendant lost in stage two. They couldn't give a reason for why they needed to deny privileges to black doctors. There's no reason why it's got to be on black. I mean, you can give quality reason, but you can't give a black reason. Same thing with prepayment. Why are you doing it on the basis of race? If you think that there's different degrees of creditworthiness, do it on creditworthiness, but you can't do it on race. Those were easy to win because the defendant just couldn't come up with something in stage two. The problem with the relocation cases is the defendant could come up with a stage two response, a legit, uh, you know, what seems like a legitimate reason. And the standard answer has been financial distress. I can't survive, I'm losing money in the inner city, I need to move out to the suburbs. Or I need to move into a more uh, profitable section of the city. Okay, or I need to just close my facilities down uh, in, the, in the minority community. And it was very difficult for the plaintiff to come back in stage three and say, no, 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 there's a way that you can become financially viable while still remaining here. And that was the challenge. The civil rights law didn't give them the evidence. They just said, you gotta come up with the evidence that shows that the legitimate reason is wrong. So that was a big hurdle. And that's one of the reasons why these relocation cases 
uh, are not succeeding. And so you can imagine a completely, you, know, you can come up with whatever you think the source of disparities is and try to work through the logic of the three-stage litigation process in Title VI cases, and you might be able to see why it is that you have difficulty. So imagine a situation where uh, you've got a hospital that's doing, and I'm not a doctor, so I could be completely wrong with this assertion, but I'm just going to come up with something. So let's imagine that I say that an African-American patient is less likely to get angioplasties at the University of Chicago than a white patient. Okay? And the black patient wants to sue. He or she, let's say, let's say it's a he, he shows that in fact he didn't get uh, uh, angioplasty uh, at the hospital. In fact, maybe even is able to show on average blacks are getting less angioplasties than whites at the University I don't mean to pick on the University of Chicago, we're a great institution, but I just want to come up with an example. The question is, what is the defendant going to do at the second stage? What is the hospital going to defend at the second stage? And they're going to say things like, oh, well, in your case, we made a medical judgment. So we don't think that you were appropriate for X, Y, and Z reasons. Uh, or we thought that, you know, uh, with angioplasty, it's a little bit hard. But, you know, if there's a treatment that requires some sort of compliance, we know we looked at your history of compliance. We don't really think it's appropriate. And unless that patient has, you know, solid reasons for saying, for sure, everybody else would be giving me an angioplasty. Right? They're going to encounter problems in stage three. And they might say stuff on aggregate, but even saying stuff on aggregate, you have to go through a lot of files right, of people that are not involved in litigation and say, actually, you just did it because I was black, even when you look at all these other people. It's a very difficult litigation posture to be in. So differential treatment cases would be extremely difficult to prosecute uh, in Title VI. Okay, relative to prepayment and privilege cases, which are just much stark, much more stark. So you might ask, okay, there's still a problem. Do we? How do we respond to this? Do we want to uh, improve enforcement of Title VI? Leave it as is in terms of the text and the jurisprudence, but expand enforcement. Spend more money on enforcement. It could be that people are not spending enough, either the government or individuals. And I have three problems with this. The first is, as I told you, I don't think Title VI can handle what are called mixed mode, what I've called mixed motive cases. That is to say, there's a differential treatment, differential behavior, but that you can come up with a legitimate reason. There might be a legitimate reason and an illegitimate reason for it. As long as there's some legitimate reason, you're stuck in stage three, and that's just a hornet's nest. Okay? It explains the relocation cases. Not only that, you've got a problem, which is if you've got a hospital and you're looking at between, within disparities, Title VI can help you. But it's very hard to get between disparities eliminated here. Right? Let's suppose there isn't a, quali high quali a decent facility uh, in uh, 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 you know, Kenwood. I know this is right next to Hyde Park, so you, know, you don't really need a separate facility in Kenwood. But let's suppose you're trying to get one in and there isn't one there. Who are you going to sue? Right? So you can't increase access, go from zero to some positive provider using civil rights. You can only go after an existing provider that's already there. And only if they're treating blacks and whites differently. Okay? You can't say, oh, there's a low quality hospital in Kenwood. I want it to get better, even though it's treating blacks and whites poorly and equally poorly. Nothing in the civil rights law says a bad quality provider has to get better for everybody. <coughs> so that's a limitation in the way Title VI is done. It, it addresses inequality within institutions within a provider. A second problem is Title VI, actually the federal government, right after passing Title VI actually carved, basically uh, substantially limited the scope of Title VI. Said it applies to institutional providers, but it does not apply to doctors. They defined Medicare Part B patients, payments, I should say, as contracts of insurance, and then say, okay, we don't deal with contracts of insurance. That's not interstate commerce. And so you carved out docs. And the reason we carved out docs, we thought was, well, docs are just not that important. They're only 5.4% of, uh, 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 of Medicare payments back in 1970. But now, they're big. They're 38%. And so what seemed like a trivial carve out, you know, it's not such a big gain to, to include them, so it's no big deal to carve them out and get some political benefits for it. Now that, that carve out has a huge cost. Okay? Maybe you could revisit that carve out. But if we're, if we're just thinking about expanding enforcement without changing Title VI, we've got a problem. Then the last thing is courts have, ham uh, uh, have hobbled Title VI. So what are, the, what are the remedies when you win a Title VI case? So if the, if the government wins, you can get, for example, decertification of a hospital. You can also get damages. You can also get an injunction telling the facility, you need to change, or the provider, if you could go after a hospital, you need to change your behavior. 
But you know, the government doesn't have a lot of money, and sometimes doesn't have the political will to spend a lot of money prosecuting these cases. And you might think, oh, okay, that's not such a big deal. Let's have individuals go after uh, hospitals uh, or institutions that discriminate on a between basis. But the government, uh, but, but the Supreme Court has limited the ability of individuals to do that. They can go after, if, if they can prove intentional discrimination, they can get damages. But if they're only trying to argue disparate impact, they can only get an injunction. Okay, and this is a case, Guardians Association versus Civil uh, Service Commission of New York. It's a big limitation. And the, let's think about the incentives for an individual. So if I got denied, and you know, I'm African American, I get denied angioplasty at the University of Chicago, what I want is money. Or I want my case changed. I don't just want an injunction saying future people should benefit, right? They're getting the benefit, I'm paying the cost of litigating. So injunctions don't incentivize litigation in the way damages do. And so that's a, that's a big limitation. So you might say, okay, well, hey, just because civil uh, Title VI is limited now, let's expand Title VI. That's the remedy. We shouldn't abandon civil rights laws. So for example, maybe we should eliminate stage three, right? And, and, and maybe even stage two, in fact, right? You can just say, you just have to prove some disparate impact. Or we might say, let's extend it to doctors. Let's extend it to doctors. Doctors are subject to Title VI. But I don't think that's gonna give us as much as we think. And there are two basic reasons. The first is that litigation is slow, uncertain, and costly. That's actually three sub-reasons I put under one bullet. But you don't have to be a, a, a litigant to realize the date from filing a suit actually getting some remedy, whether it's damages or injunctions, uh, it could be months. If you're lucky, it's typically years, particularly if you count for appeals. So I want an angioplasty today. I don't want to sue tomorrow, if I get figured out by tomorrow, and then three years later or six years later get a remedy. That doesn't help me. Okay, I need the answer today. And not only that, a lot of times when I don't get the angioplasty, I might just think I didn't get the angioplasty because I was inappropriate. I have to figure out that it was actually because of discrimination. Most people don't discover this. So I think that there's a lot of people that may be suffering discrimination that you know, technically might be Title VI, but you just don't know enough to, to actually sue. Okay. And the last thing is litigation is costly. You know, What I'd like is I don't get the angioplasty. It's because I'm black. I want you to just spend the money to give me an angioplasty. I don't want to spend three times that amount of money on a lawyer to then get you to spend, give me an angioplasty. It's a very costly process. It is not that, it, look, I love lawyers. I am one. <laughs> but I don't think that that's the best way to solve social problems, paying them all the time. Okay? I'd, rather much, I'd much rather just, just provide the better care if we, if we could figure out a way to do that. The other problem is, and this is way more fundamental than litigation, even if we can improve litigation, you get a lot of settlements, you could have uh, uh, just a mu much more effective li litigation process, you still have the problem that this is an inadequate penalty. And here's the reason why. And this is why I suspect that Title VI was successful early on and not successful now. If we look at the penalty of certification, or decertification, I, I should say, right? that's not really a good answer. So let's suppose that University of Chicago is not uh, providing angioplasties at this, uh, you know, sorry, I gotta pause for a second. In general, we think we overuse angioplasty, so I'm not sure it's a bad thing for, for people to get la less angioplasty, but just, just roll with me on this, uh, on this example. Uh, there's a different line of research that I do where I wonder about that problem, uh, but, but, but uh, yeah, I've chosen it, so I'm gonna stick with it. So, so if the problem is I, African-American patient, or, or other African-American patients are not getting angioplasties, the question is, does decertification help as a remedy? And the answer is probably not, because what decertification does is reduce the amount of money that the hospital is getting, leaving both blacks and whites at the hospital worse off. Okay? And even if I got damages, by the way, that may help me, but what about the other African American patients that are going to this hospital? Now there's less resources uh, available for them. And the bigger way to, uh, or another way to phrase this is that this statute redistributes money from, let's say, uh, non-black patients to black patients. It doesn't increase the amount of resources at the hospital overall. It doesn't cause an outside source to pump in money. Now, if you're in a world where, where hospitals have tons of extra funds, right? so you're in the 60s and early 70s when the federal government is funding huge capital investments by hospitals okay, to deal with the fact that you've got this increased demand through Medicare and whatnot then hospitals are flush with funds. And you can say, oh yeah, take a dollar that you're giving to a white and give it to a black person, 
and it's not that big a deal because it's, it's, it's the return on the white person is lower than the return on the black person. But now you're in a situation where that money is not coming in. We're trying to cut back expenditures. Hospitals are in dire financial straits, or relatively speaking. Now you're taking a poor hospital and you're saying, let's take money from the white person and give it to the black person in that hospital. Right? You're hurting the white way more than you could have in the past when you had uh, lots of funds. In any case, what that result might be is that you're giving inadequate treatment to both. Okay? So it really works. This is a good strategy for a cash flush environment. It is not as good a strategy for a, uh, an environment in which you're, you have a dearth of resources. Okay? Uh, in part, I'm saying it's not just a problem of targeting. It's a problem of targeting and resources. So here are my alternate remedies. Some of them are not mine. They're being done by other people. So take the ACA. The ACA may potentially reduce disparities in a big way simply because it is providing access to, low, to, uh, access to health care and health insurance for low-income individuals, expanding Medicaid and providing tax credits. Okay? And if it's true that African Americans have uh, a higher rate of poverty or a lower average rate of uh, average income, then although it's a race-neutral uh, uh, statute, it's going to disproportionately benefit minority communities. Okay? Now you have to be careful though. Remember how I said that disparities are in some sense driven by the, the rate of return that you're going to get? It's not enough to just to give access. You've got to be a little bit careful about the other things that the ACA does. So for example, if the ACA is trying to come back on reimbursements by Medicare to doctors, then doctors are not that excited about Medicare. Right? And Medicare can't be used as a lever to get, blacks to, the, uh, to get providers to provide better care to, to blacks. So you want to not just provide more access to insurance, but also make sure reimbursement is there so there's a financial return to taking care of African Americans. Oh, the Affordable Care Act, sorry. Uh, so it's the big health care legislation from this year. Affordable Care Act. It's actually the, uh, it's the PPACA, and uh, PAPACA is an uh, odd sounding acronym, so I use the term ACA. Other people prefer Obamacare. I, I like the ACA. Okay? But it's the big bill passed earlier this year. Okay? Now, there are other things in the, in the, in the, that, that, that are in part due to the ACA, in part due to um, just reform in healthcare generally, that might help. So anything that, lists the, uh, that increases or lifts the average quality of hospitals, like, for example, affordable, affordable care organizations, basically vertical integration between hospitals and, and doctors. If, you're one of the, if you've drunk the Kool-Aid and you think that's going to improve quality overall, then it should improve quality for blacks and whites. And if it has a bigger impact on lower quality providers, then it's going to disproportionately prevent, uh, help African Americans relative to, to non-African Americans. Okay? So that's all great. But I think, or at least I strongly suspect that the best remedy may be to actually target the worst off. The worst off, not by race, but just target the worst, lowest quality hospitals in the country. And if you target the lowest quality hospitals in the country, you're going to disproportionately help blacks because blacks end up at the lowest quality hospitals in the country. And so let me give you some kind of preliminary data on this. Right? So before I argued that between disparity has a larger impact, I gave you a 60% number. This is just another illustration of this. Uh, same sort of data, except I'm going to look at both AMI results and pneumonia results. I'm going to look at percentage of hospital discharges are black, that are black. You can go from hospitals that have no blacks at all. There are some hospitals that just really have only treat whites because there are no blacks in the neighborhood to ones that 80% of the population to 100% of the population that they treat discharges are black. So you're going from white to black. You see the percentage of quality for either AMI or pneumonia falls as you go to the black hospitals. And what you want to think about is, what do I care about? Do I care about the between differences? You know, those are meaningful, I guess. Not I guess, they are meaningful. But then if you want to think about what is the difference instead between the average of being at a good quality hospital versus a bad quality hospital, that's much bigger. OK? And that's the, that's the reason why I say between disparities has a larger impact. What I'm saying is, Let's send funds to these hospitals. We don't have to do it on the basis of whether they're black. Just have to do it on the basis of whether they're low quality, because they both happen to be both low quality and black. If you just target the worst hospitals in America, you're going to disproportionately help minorities. And so here's a little uh, simulation that gives you a sense of what you can do with targeted interventions. So the previous chart, by the way, was for hospitals. I'm going to turn to, I've done this experiment uh, uh, for uh, diabetes centers. Or I should say this experiment is done for diabetes centers. So this is the current disparity, which is to say 
Um, this is the percentage of recommended care received by diabetics. So we're looking at ambulatory care facilities that are treating diabetics. Sorry to switch back and forth between hospitals and, and these types of facilities. But um, if, you have, uh, if you're a white person, you're going to get 77% of the recommended uh, 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 care. If you're black, you're only going to get 70% of the recommended care. 7% is the disparity. What happens if you eliminate all within uh, network or within uh, uh, facility disparities? You'll leave the whites where they are at 77. You'll raise the blacks from 70 to 75. Okay, that's good. It's a 5 percentage point gain. But now let's suppose instead you took that money. Instead of focusing on all, all, all networks, whether they have low quality or high quality and reducing the gap between blacks and whites within them, instead you just say, I'm going to target my funds at the uh, low quality facilities and try to raise them up. And, and specifically, you have to tell me how much I'm going to raise them up. Let's suppose I can raise them up to 85% of the recommended care. No change to within network disparities. I'm not going to try to address that at all. What do you get? You basically are going to shove up blacks to 81%, okay? And whites are going to benefit a little bit as well, just because there are some whites that go to facilities where they're predominantly blacks. You get much greater bang for your buck this way. Not only that, if you just target the worst hospitals aiming for the between disparities, you'll actually eliminate a lot of the within disparities because it turns out the biggest within disparities occur at the hospitals that are the worst. So it's the worst hospitals that discriminate between blacks and whites the most in some sense. And the way to see that is, again, we're looking at diabetes uh, care centers. This axis is going to give the uh, percentage of recommended diabetes care received by blacks, percentage of diabetes care received by whites. If you're on the 45 degree angle, that means you are giving equal treatment to both groups. But we're finding that you're giving, uh, um, uh, this is an oblong, this is not a purely uh, uh, square graph anyway, but um, you'll see that whites are generally getting more than blacks. Non-whites, non-blacks are getting more than, than blacks. But you might want to say, OK, well, let's figure out where I think the within disparities are, the highest. And that's the difference thing. So the, each of these dots is a facility, OK? And plotting what is the fraction the blacks are getting, what is the fraction the whites are getting at that facility. And you might say, OK, the distance between, the, between a dot and the 45 degree, angle, uh, diff, degree line tells you the <coughs> excess care that, that whites are getting. That's why you see so many of these above the line. Whites are getting more. But the difference is going to tell you how, whether that, how, how much of a disparity there is within. And the larger that disparity, the more likely it's going to be statistically significant. You'll see the biggest statistically significant disparities. They're marked in red, by the way. All the red dotted, uh, each facility with the red dot is one that has statistically significant within disparity. You'll see that those are, tend to be on the left-hand side of all the drops. So if you get higher quality facilities, you're less likely to get them than if you have lower quality facilities. So targeting between will get you some within. Now the last thing, and this is the sort of question I would ask, which is really throwing money at the problem. You think that's going to help? Don't you think it's a more serious problem than that? And I'll admit that it's problematic. So you know, if you take, for example, disproportionate share uh, funding for hospitals, these are hospitals that are providing disproportionate share of care for med poor Medicare populations. One of the difficulties when the government said, you know, if a state allocates some money to a county hospital that, for DSH, DSH funds, uh, the federal government will match it. Uh, one of the problems was the, the states would then just backdoor out some of the funds from that hospital through intergovernmental transfers. And what we're typically finding is for every 50 cents that a state spent on DSH payments, the federal government matched it with another 50 cents. But then <laughs> through backdoor measures, the states took back 40 cents. So in effect, they were providing 10 cents and the government was providing 50 cents, but not given a whole, whole dollar. Okay? So that's a concern. So we got to make sure that we don't just throw money at the problem in a way that states can, can take and use for other purposes. Now, obviously, it's harder to do that if you're giving money to a private hospital than if you're giving it to a, a state hospital. Okay? But, but, but let's suppose that, that, that you could control this right, through proper accounting methods. I think you can make a huge impact on mortality. And here I'm going to cite research by uh, 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 Kate Baker and, and Doug Steger, uh, now at Harvard and Dartmouth, respectively. And what they said is, OK. Let's look at 28-day uh, infant mortality rates and 90 days. It's very hard to read, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the results here. So this is, I'm going to take a look at 28-day infant mortality and 90-day uh, AMI mortality, post-AMI mortality. And I'm going to say, how does that change at a hospital uh, after they get uh, uh, DSH funds? And, I'm gonna, and they try to separate out DSH funds either by looking at all DH, DSH funds, whether or not it's diverted, right? 
And they sometimes try to break it down into, OK, let's suppose that I can figure out how much was not diverted and how much was diverted. And so look at effective versus ineffective DSH funds. And here's what they find. If you don't control for the appropriation, you still find that if you give hospitals $100, you're going to prevent 0.65 deaths per 1,000 births. And you're going to reduce, you're going to uh, avoid 9.2 deaths per 1,000 heart attacks. Just off of $100. Now, if you break that down into effective funds, ones that are not diverted to ones that are diverted, you're going to get better results. You find basically you're going to have uh, one death, 1.06 deaths per 1,000 births, or two, uh, 21 uh, deaths per 1,000 heart attacks. That's meaningful. In fact, if you go further and you say, OK, does it make a difference whether I go to uh, private or, or, or not? Um, no, as it turns out, whether you send the money to a private hospital or a public hospital, you're getting this fund just by throwing money at the problem. You're letting the hospital decide what to do with the money, but that's what you're getting. Okay. The main thing is to avoid the, the, disproport the, the ineffective DSH, because that money itself is not doing a lot of work. Okay, Insi statistically insignificant work. So I'm a, I, I don't like throwing money at problems. I'd like to have an incentive compatible scheme that makes sure that people are doing the right things, but if you can't get that. Sometimes you've got to go with the second best, and the second best might be throwing money at the problem. I just want the, second, the, be, the, the money to be thrown at the worst hospitals. And I think that's going to lift, uh, uh, reduce the disparity between blacks and whites. Well, blacks and whites will benefit there, but, but it's not there. So let me just quickly finish up by saying civil rights laws are not a great tool. Targeted funding, I think, is better. And indirect, when I say indirectly targeting, I mean you're not targeting it at blacks. You're targeting it at poor hospitals who happen to benefit blacks because the blacks are going to poor hospitals. But the important thing to recognize is there are still persistent gaps in healthcare treatment and outcomes. And however you want to deal with it, we got to deal with it. Okay, I just think that there's a there's there's a different remedy that's going to be more effective than the old remedy we used to use. Okay, I saw a hand back there. Yeah. Uh, so you uh, started by emphasizing how much interaction uh, there is between the terms that might go into the model related to socioeconomic status, uh, bias, compliance, et cetera. I believe that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, and then using AMI mortality at 90 days as at least one acute, uh, as a window into this is interesting because that's a disease process where access isn't an issue. When the patient presents with a chest pain syndrome, they're admitted. It's not any choice on that. And then they're out, they're almost never in the hospital for 90 days. Yeah. And their mortality is determined by not only their acute intervention, but their ability to get follow up, their ability to get drug therapy, and a bunch of things. So uh, I just wonder how much you've been able to sort those, those factors out. I almost wonder whether it wouldn't be better to use in hospital mortality. And I don't know if you've analyzed that because making the hospital process different if the outcome is dictated by post-hospital access, would be throwing money at the wrong problem. No, Maybe. I agree. And, and, and we want to be careful. We don't want to just, so, so part of this problem is, you know, I'm, uh, uh, you know, the bum that looks for his, uh, his or the, the drunk guy that looks for his keys under the lamppost. Uh, that's the only place where there's light. And so I got to look at outcomes that I can actually measure. And I will admit that 90-day mortality is, is a bad outcome, in part for the reasons that you suggested. But the alternative, uh, is, for example, in hospital mortality. I have two problems with that. One is the incidence, the, the rate at mortality is much lower. So I've got uh, other problems. Um, and the other thing is that also affecting that subpopulation, I would guess, and I'm not a doctor, you are, I, I would guess, <laughs> is that, is that uh, the question is how quickly you respond to the chest pain. And so it could be that you know, the rate at which an ambulance picks up a person makes a big difference on the differential between di in dying in hospital because of an AMI. And so again, instead of measuring the post with the 90-day, now I'm measuring the pre uh, with the in. So you know, there are flaws in each one of these. I'd like to look at a composite of these. I'd like to actually get better outcomes. One of the biggest complaints I have as a researcher is I want to see Medicare data with more outcomes and not just death. Unfortunately, uh, I, I'm not as persuasive uh, as I'd like to be, and I can't, I can't get that, those measurements. Of course, it's costly to measure them, but I'd like to get more. So I, I think more work needs to be done there. I'm going to just work with what I have right now to give us a clue as to what's going on. The thing that I'm really worried about is if I think that the outcomes I look at have a systematic bias in terms of ascertaining the causes or the, the, the channels through which black-white gaps uh, persist. There I'm really worried. So, so if we've got ideas for why certain outcomes as opposed to others are going to exacerbate black-white differences, then I've got to be particularly cognizant of that in this sort of analysis. I, I haven't got that just yet. Thanks. That was great.
Yes. Yeah. Anup, uh, this is really interesting. A couple of sort of suggestions. One would be uh, to sort of jump on Jesse's uh, question. I think some of the outcomes you choose seem odd to me. And I think that outcomes that might be better would be outcomes of practice as opposed to outcomes of death. So for instance, if you look at that baby example that you talked about, it's going to, for the infant mortality, and the effect was going to be 0.65 per no. thousand. Yeah. Okay. That turns out to be about 10% of all of the black-white difference in uh, birth mortality. And so... Uh, what, what percentage you said? 10%. 10%. In percent. other words, black, white death is about 6 per thousand and black death is about 12 per thousand. And if you're going to save 0.65 yeah, right. per thousand, yeah, you know, yeah it's, it's not a big phenomenon. Yeah. And so, I mean, at some level, that was a depressing number for me to see. And so the... the the point that I'd probably make is, you know Jack Weinberg's? But it's only $100. Right, but you have yeah. no way to scale up. I mean, it's not the case that a million dollars is going to yeah. mean no, that no, nobody will the, ever the, die. The, I've asserted a linear, a linear parameter. It yeah. could be you know, concave. Right. Uh, you know Jack Weinberg's stuff about practice variation? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it strikes me that that would be a better outcome measure for you to look at if you can. I don't like the, that because uh, I, the, the, I mean, even in that literature, when people say there's practice variation, one of the criticisms that it's getting is that the variation doesn't show up as big differences in outcomes because basically what you're getting is flat of the curve medicine regardless of what specific practice you're, you're engaging in. That's one problem. And the other thing is the latest kind of cutting edge research, actually, as it turns out, by Amitabh Chandra uh, and another co author, uh, basically says what, what's happening is, you know, take. Uh, somebody that, that deals with, with heart conditions through intensive surgical treatments versus ones that use predominantly medicine, right? So intensive versus non-intensive. What you're finding is both are flat of the curve, and they actually have remarkably different, ignoring costs, different uh, similar uh, returns. And the reason is because there's specialization in each. Um, and in fact, what you don't want to do is eliminate, necessarily eliminate the variation by saying the person that's doing angioplasties ought to be doing more medicine. If you say that, then they're not trained in that or they're not specialized in that, so you can actually worsen outcomes. And so given that stuff, I, don't, I'm, I want to be very careful about using just the fact of variation as an outcome measure. I really want to, I don't want to use that as a biomarker for the real thing, which is outcomes. But I do think you're right that, uh, and I'll get back to the, to the, to the um, uh, Kate Baker study in just a second, the, the Baker and Steger study. Um, I do think that we want to look at, look at outcomes, and I do understand that uh, these might not be the appropriate outcomes. Now, getting back to Baker and Steger, and, and one of, the, one of the great things here, and this is why I think that there's an import, important role for collaboration between doctors, medical researchers, and, and social scientists, particularly economics researchers, is because the economists don't know if there are procedures or other indicators other than death that are good measures of outcomes. Doctors do, and so they need to talk to each other. We can offer some statistical methodology. You can offer facts and reality, and so that's great. Um, but back to Baker and Steger, they're not interested uh, so beyond the scaling up, they're not interested in getting at the black-white gap. Um, what they're just interested in finding out is if there's an overall effect. One of the criticisms that you can have for that is that, you know, it could be that it lowered the averages, but it only everybody focused the dollars just on whites, right? That would be the biggest criticism I have with the throwing money at the problem issue, is if we actually did think that there was some institutional bias, just giving a hospital more money could be that they just give the money to, to white patients and not to black patients. So I don't think that this is a panacea. That's the area where I think the biggest weakness is here. Uh, the 6.5 percent, that's why I'm a little bit careful about putting that in the context of a black-white gap, because I don't know if that's just compressed everything or increased the gap. I just want to be a little bit careful about that. So, so at the end, your conclusion was to devote more resources to the poorest performing hospitals, but there were a lot of different ways to do that and a lot of different ways to set up the incentives and potentially penalties. So why don't you talk a little bit more about, like, more specifics about how you would design that transfer system in your ideal world? Yeah, so, so you can actually couple it with a measurement of black-white outcomes. So pick some outcomes that you like, and it could be inputs, like the rate of which procedures are given, or it could be outputs in terms of outcomes. And you could say, I'm going to give payments to the poorest performing hospitals, but the degree of payments that you get varies depending on uh, how, much, how much you're reducing that gap. You know, the same thing we do, just change, change, uh, 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 switch gears for a second and think about uh, schools. And what we want to do is we want to get schools to do better, to teach their students a little bit better. And, and, and we can not just give them money, but we could give them money that's geared towards the rate at which they progress. 
And instead of just looking at the rate at which test scores progress in the hospital context, you might want to think about how the black-white gap progresses. Or I think even better than that, instead of fixing at a gap, because I don't want the gap to be addressed by taking money just away from whites, what I'd like to do is I'd like to say, this is where black infant mortality rates are now, conditional on risk, right? So you do some risk adjustment. I want to see this rise. If you can make it rise to, you know, by 10%, I'm going to give you or to a, a fixed absolute value. I'm going to give you X amount of dollars. If you can rise, raise it a little more, I'm going to give you 2x or 2.5x and things like that. Those sorts of incentive schemes, uh, I, I think, are good. So if you want to make it, to, you want to make sure that they're not just taking the money and spending it just on the whites. But I don't think that that's the. I mean, here's the real. Here's the one way to answer how important that sort of gap is. And why you might think that at the poor hospitals, I want to work even harder on making sure that it's incentivized towards helping blacks and not just helping everybody. Look at the black-white gaps. No, that's, not, that's, black, white that's white the cute MI versus Oh, sorry. Uh, go back further, actually. I want to go back to this. Right? Is that black-white? No, one more. So here's what you want to ask. You want to say, OK. Do I, need, do I need to target, make sure that the money is just sent to these hospitals? Or do I need to make sure it's sent to these hospitals and the black population within these hospitals? What you wanna, the, the, to address that question, you want to say, OK, do I think the black-white gap is largest at the worst facilities? OK? And this chart tells you no. There's another chart that's going to tell you yes. So let me explain what this chart says. This chart says, basically, if you look at the black hospitals, black, predominantly black serving hospitals, this is the gap. If you go to one that's not, predominantly black serving, surviving for more whites, the gap's very similar. So the key qu issue is if I can just send money here to lower both things, I'm going to get a lot of the work done. I don't need to disproportionately say if I send it to them, I need to focus a lot on the black-white differences. But the flip side is this chart, which says that, that if you look at the worst hospital, this, this is now, by the way, the last one was hospitals. This is ambulatory care facilities uh, treating diabetes. Here you're finding the gaps largest at the lowest quality facilities. So if you're targeting money here, and the gaps are the biggest, within gaps are biggest here, then you might want to do a, a kind of a more nuanced scheme where I'm not just throwing you money, but I'm saying I'm going to give you money, and I'm going to give you more money if I can lower this. The answer should not be penalties. You see, it should be pretty obvious why it should not be penalties. Because you've already got a low performing facility. By saying I'm going to penalize you more if you don't provide help to the blacks, you just redo, you're undoing the money that you gave them. They're already financially constrained. In some sense, that's what the civil rights statutes do. They penalize the worst hospitals. But this is a hospital without the money in the first place. So that's not helping the blacks at those hospitals. What you want to do instead is reward gains in reducing the black-white disparity or just ab living, uh, uh, you know, kind of raising the level of quality for blacks, but at the worst hospitals. Does that make sense? So that's the kind of nuanced answer I would give. I have to think a lot more about mechanically how I'd implement that. I mean, there are exper you know, we're just now starting to seriously experiment and I'll put seriously in quotes, uh, with pay for performance within Medicare. We've got to do a lot more of that. I mean, I think that pay for performance is generally a good idea, although I want to be a little bit careful about that. I'd like to see some more experimental data. But I, I tend to be on the pro side rather than the con side. But you know, I want to see some more stuff before I start saying, let's do pay for performance uh, on black-white. It's very important that you get your outcomes right, the metrics. We learned this from uh, No Child Left Behind. All right, great. All right. So everybody believes exactly what I said. This is fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks.